This is Spotlight, a series inspired by Spin's journey of reimagining mobility in cities. Join us as we host conversations with innovators and influencers who are shaking things up. So I'm Yoon, the co-founder and president of Spin, the electric scooter sharing company, and uh, I'm really excited here today to welcome uh, Benjamin Von Wong. And uh, this is part of a series where we just bring in really cool, exciting, and game-changing people uh, who are doing really interesting things in, across different fields, uh, and to learn about their stories, uh, see what kind of moves them and drives them, and, and figure out you know what's what's really what's next. So. Uh, Benjamin, I think I'll, I'll let you kind of introduce yourself to, uh, a little bit. You've been doing some amazing photography work. Yeah, so gosh, I, I never know how to introduce myself. My name is Benjamin Von Wong. I am an artist and I create work within the social impact space. Awesome. And what's the, so the last name, that's a non-traditional. It's uh, invented. It's invented. Tell me, is there a story behind it? Yeah, so uh, when I, you know, the first thing you do when you decide to become an artist or anyone any kind of a public theory is by a domain name and so mm -hmm. I went and checked, checked out Benjamin Wong and it turns out it was a photographer six hours drive away in Toronto yeah. and I was like no nah, I can't do that gotta be a little different so I had to invent something and Vaughn means from in German mm -hmm. so Vaughn Wong from the family of Wong just seems to be kind of cute kind of unique kind of different and awesome and, and so you and since. yeah you and I both share being uh, being from Canada yeah uh, how, did, how do you think that has shaped your um, your whole career. I mean, do you think do you do you still share a trait of being Canadian, or, or do you are you more like a do you, do you consider yourself more of a global citizen at this point? I think I consider myself Canadian. Is I mean, what 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 is a Canadian? Someone who grew up in Canada. Like, I mean, I feel like we don't have like really specific shared values other than we're supposed so, yeah. to be nice <laughs> and we're supposed to like the environment and we're supposed to be you know good people and all this stuff, but. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think I'm a little bit of a third culture kid, mm -hmm. ultimately. Like, I've grown up in, in the United States, in Canada, in China. Um, I've done all three um, in different phases. And so, really, I don't necessarily fit in anywhere particularly. And that, I think, is exactly what Canadians are. They yeah. just don't That's quite fit in. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and this big melting pot. So it's kind of kicking off with some, some talk about the work that you've done and obviously some, some amazing stuff on, on photog photography. Side. How did this all kind of kick it? kick off really I mean was it a was it personal passion was it um, was it something you were doing as a hobby it was a breakup mm, yeah interesting. as with all great stories there's a breakup involved I was studying to be a hard rock mining engineer at the time and I was working in a mine in uh, Winnemucca Nevada yeah and the uh, girl broke up with me while I was there and I was like oh my gosh I have nothing to do what am I going to do to keep myself busy mm -hmm. and so I just looked up stars looked pretty I was like let's try to take pictures of the stars and went to Walmart bought a camera and uh, things just kind of kept going from there. Yeah, and, and you've turned this into um, sort of the core thing that you do. How has that evolved from being a like a hobby to to what you what you do now? And, and how did you, how did you link it up with a sort of bigger purpose and, yeah. and a mission? Yeah, I think well in the in the beginning it was really I mean this is this is like a ten year span story yeah. that you just asked me. So um, when it when I first started off it was a little bit of a hobby. It was something to distract me, something to keep myself busy. And then I think the first major pivot was when. I uh, discovered that you could earn money with photography. I was invited to shoot an event and I was like, hey, this is the first time ever I've been paid to have fun. Mm -hmm. This is great, let's do more of it. And then about a year and a half into that, I realized that I started having two jobs because I was doing a lot of event photography, weddings and all that stuff. And then I had engineering and I was doing both at the same time. I was like, wait, but that was never the plan. I never got into this to have two jobs. I just want one job and I want to have fun, right? Yeah. And so that's when I started doing the crazier um, sets building a little bit of fantasy and, and grew that from there and then one day I woke up after three and a half years of being an engineer and came up to the realization that I didn't want to be doing the same thing in 10 years I didn't want to be sitting in front of a bigger desk earning a little bit more money doing something I really didn't care about mm -hmm. and even though I didn't know what I wanted to do um, I knew it wasn't engineering so when I quit my job it wasn't to become an artist it wasn't to become a photographer it was merely to not do um, yeah. When was this? Not this do engineering. This was 2012. 2012. Yeah. So, so I quit my day job and I just started traveling. And then photography just happened to be the best way to travel for free. I had 7,000 followers at the time, but that gave me enough leeway to be able to hit up a photo club, find, find some community leader and just say like, hey, would you be interested in organizing a workshop for me? And then they'd organize a workshop. I'd get a free plane ticket somewhere, right. stay on someone's sofa. Yeah. I'd get a little bit of money to create some new photos and then I'd just travel to the next place so I just traveled for free for like a year and a half yeah and then along the way built my profile as a as a creative 
eventually got some big commercial jobs. And then from there, started questioning everything. I, I got the biggest career of my life in 2015. Mm -hmm. I got a global campaign with Huawei, earned more money in that one job than my entire career combined. And I went like, wow, that sucked. It's not exactly what I wanted to do. I mean, I was... I was the work or the... Uh, the process? The process. The, I mean, the pinnacle. I mean, I think most creatives just dream of getting paid to do what they do best. And, 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 and I got there and it just wasn't enough. I was getting paid to do what I did best, but it served to no purpose except to move product off a shelf. It just felt very What empty. was the campaign? Like what, what style and what, what did you end up shooting? I ended up using one of their cell phones, the Huawei P8, and we created these um, wings of fire that we used. We, f we created a fire angel with their light painting feature and just mm -hmm. did this like fire painting thing. And where, where the money came in was the licensing of the images. I mean, I had my face blown up on the side of these two story built like the Westfield mall in London and, and like videos of my campaign were being played before, um, movies in, in, in cinemas all across Malaysia. And like, mm -hmm. you know, it was, it was in airports all over the world and all this stuff. I, I really, sh what I should have done is taken the money and done a selfie tour where I took photos of my face in front of my face. <laughs> All, the, all over the world, but I just never did that. Um, that would have been hilarious. But that just raised so many questions for me. It's just like, well, if, if, that did, if that's not what I want to do, then like where, what, what were the projects that like were the most memorable to me? Which ones did I value the most? Mm -hmm. And it was always the ones that were about giving back. Hmm. And so I just decided to, in 2016, to give myself the challenge of saying, well, I'm going to take a year. I'm going to figure out how to just earn money doing good in the world, yeah. figure it out. And uh, it took me 18 months actually to get my first paid gig. In the in the impact space and i just haven't looked back since so i've been doing exclusively social impact based large-scale projects that have taken an environmental slant these days i'm yeah. doing installations i'm doing photography they're they're larger than life they're crazy they're they're starting to go extend beyond photography so i start to do a lot of um of physical experiences and mm -hmm. installations that have a photography component that have a video component and all these just kind of later layer yeah. together yeah so we were chatting about this before as well like you you're, you're mentioning what you, what you see as a huge opportunity here in, in unlocking, what was it, design and impact and linking them all together? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, a lot of the investment that we see going into this world today are all technolog te technological. Mm -hmm. I mean, no one's investing really in culture because if you look at the cultural investments, they're all in entertainment or marketing. Like nobody is really looking into how do we improve the ecosystem? that we live in and that's because the incentives aren't aligned mm -hmm. algorithms are designed to keep people on their devices to spend more time scrolling through things yep. not to achieve anything not to make their lives better but just so that you can sell them ads right. and and so the incentives are completely misaligned um, and what you see is like a, a lot of the polarization that we see in the world today a lot of the, the rift and the divide and the unhappiness um, I think just comes from this this separation between technology and culture mm -hmm. um, but no one's investing in culture right. and it makes sense because what is the value of an art piece? Like what, how much is this and why, why is it worth something? Mm -hmm. Are you settled on a solution yet? Or, or uh, is this something that you're just still exploring and how this kind of all converges in terms of kind of a focusing investment on, on design? Is that something that... I mean, I don't have billions of dollars to dish out to culture. Um, I don't know what the idea, what, what the model might look like. Mm -hmm. But I think that there is universal acceptance that... You know, if you look at the future of work, who's yeah. going to lead? Artists, right? Because you need, you need the orthogonal thinkers. You need people who are thinking differently to then set the processes in motion. So yeah. everyone knows it's there, but no one's investing in it. So who's going to come out on top? I don't know. Yeah. And how long have you seen your work kind of impact? Some of your work kind of make, make impact so far? Yeah, um, well, I mean... There's been campaigns you've done? like a I've done a number of campaigns, that, and, and, and I do have... Um, I have a lot of impressions, I have a lot of views, I have a lot of traction, I have a lot of press, and I have yeah. all, this, all these like KPIs, so like the videos that I've made that document the process of what I do, have over 100 million views, organic. Mm -hmm. But what does that mean? Doesn't, it's, that's actually not the value of what I create. What the value of what I create is, is, is the qualitative part of it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's shifting perspectives, it's changing hearts and minds. Um, it's, op it's opening people up, but I can't sell that to a room full of suits, right? right. You either get it or you don't. You, uh, an, a piece of art, a song, it speaks to you or it doesn't. Um, so it, it makes it really difficult. And what causes are top of mind for you right now, uh, today? Um, I've been spending a lot of time in the environmental space. Mm -hmm. It's just something that I think affects all of us, but it's not about one cause. It's sort of a system, right? Like you can't, you can't expect the environment to solve itself if you also don't contribute to poverty. You can't tackle poverty without technology you can't tackle technology without like people and so they, everything is sort of tied in so 
I personally don't care about which avenue I, I, I play in. I just see myself as sort of um, maybe a missing link between different parts. Like mm -hmm. I really serve the divide between the people who maybe don't know about something and hopefully a company that can provide a solution. And so I'm just basically in marketing and comms, right. except that I'm an artist, right? Right. And you're yeah. your own independent layer in, in a way. I'm my own game. independent layer. Uh, I'm I'm one guy, but but you know, just like many artists, like we're like experts at collaboration because you don't do anything alone. You yeah. do things um, with a team of people that you build um, as needed to tackle the project and the mission that you all have together. Right. Yeah. So so what's next? I mean, in terms of projects and that and uh, things that you're spearheading in, in the coming year or so? It's hard to say, right? Because I have a lot of ideas, I have a lot of conversations, but I don't have a lot of commitments. And, and anything that is committed, anything that involves a brand, I can't talk about. Mm, right. And so really, I can't tell you what, what I'm going to be up to. Um, and, it's, and it's not that I don't want to tell you, it's I don't actually know. I, I don't know where I'm going to be next month. It depends on which projects come through. Right. And so it's that kind of a month, month to month thing. But like on a, um, I think on a more, on a grander level, I'm... Uh, I'm, I'm focusing on more collaborations with corporations mm -hmm. because I think that we have to rope them into these conversations. They have marketing dollars they're going to spend anyways. Let's put it to good use. So yeah. that's, that's what I'm doing on one end. Um, I'm tackling the idea of uh, creating an episodic, episodic series mm -hmm. um, of these adventures, of these creations, of these processes to share with people how that's done. That's um, a second thing. Um, on the side, I'm ideating the idea of a startup. I've always been fascinated by the idea of figuring out how to connect art and impact and how to scale that. Yep. And it really starts with providing a financial model for people to be incentivized to do right. that, right? So you have a ton of social enterprises out there that are hungry for content that is mission driven, mm -hmm. but it's very hard to find. How do you connect those two parts? So that's what I'm thinking about on the side too. I've been doing a ton of speaking engagements. Um, that's actually how I do a lot of my lead generation. Um, I, don't, I don't pitch, I just talk about what I believe in and right. I wait for people to come who, yeah. who understand what it, what it is that I have to offer. And then together we conspire to create something. And, and you know, you really learn that it, all you need is one person within an organization, organization and institution. You just need one person who believes in it, mm -hmm. who's willing to fight for it, who's willing to go out of their way. Right. And that opens up all the doors. Yeah. So. You've learned the key to enterprise sales, really. There Finding you go. You're, you're a champion. Everything just reduces one. down to being a, a startup. Yeah. Exactly. And so now you're based here in, in San Francisco or most I, of the time? I pay rent in San pay Francisco. Rent in San Francisco. Uh, yeah. I've been paying rent here for four years. I am here uh, for uh, sometimes less than six months out of the year. So. What yeah. do you find interesting about the city and the art scene here? This is kind of a, an interesting topic. Uh, you know, we were chit-chatting about um, the design culture here or the potential lack of community. Lack thereof, yeah. It's, uh, it's kind of interesting that you've taken up, um, you've, you've you made this your home in, or your home base. And even though that the natural fit might, you know, if you think about uh, major art metropolitans in the world, yeah. you think of LA, you think of Shanghai, you don't really think of San Francisco, but you've chosen to, to kind of make your, your base here. I've always liked being the weirdest person in the room. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know why you would want to go somewhere where everyone is doing the same thing as you are. Um, I like people who think differently. I mean, ultimately, if I'm a storyteller, I need stories to tell. Mm -hmm. I don't need other people doing the same thing like me. I mean, you can find collaborators wherever you go. You can bring them in. You can, you can draw talent wherever you need them to be. But if you're not meeting the people who are going to be funding it or the people who are going to be generating the ideas with you, who are going to synergize with you, then you can't create. As I said earlier, like what I really care about is the idea of scaling impact because it doesn't matter how successful I become as one person. I'm never going to be able to make a difference beyond what I can touch. Yeah. And that's always going to be limited. So I want to figure out a way that I can empower everyone. Um, and so I look at myself very much as just a case study. I'm, I'm using myself as an experiment and trying to figure out how can I replicate models of my own success yeah. and apply that to other people. And, yeah. and, I, and I do that by sharing the process of everything that I do. So for every single photo shoot or installation that I create, there's a video that explains how the whole thing was done. And that's all open, it's all shared. I've been doing it for the last decade. You know, right now I have an ongoing series on Instagram where every single day I'm posting a lesson that I've learned. I gave myself that challenge for 60 days. Um, and it's just going through all these creative processes. How do, you, how do you get out of a creative block? How do you find sponsorships? How do you do that? But how do you create that in like, I don't know, an interesting 150 word tidbit, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm pouring a lot of time and effort into these, these pieces and it's all with the intention of actually maybe starting to catalyze a movement. And I haven't figured out the exact format and what speaks to me, but I think that's sort of, that's sort of the startup mentality, right? You throw a bunch of things at the wall and you figure out what sticks. Yep. Right? And that's what I'm doing. I just, I just keep throwing things. Or you solve your own wall. problem yeah. and then it sort of solves someone yeah. else's problem too. Exactly. And then a bunch of people kind of yeah. come along for the ride. Yeah.
Yeah. So uh, one of the problems that I have is that I've spent so much time trying to be different in mm. order to, to stand out, to survive as an artist, that my life journey is so radically unrelatable. Um, and so in so many ways, it's like, okay, how do I distill that back down to something like simple and, and, and that can be reapplied. So I kind of have this weird conundrum. So I am where I am today because of all these things that I've done and I managed to stand out because I'm so unique, Yeah. but it also makes it very accessible to everyone. So there's this like kind of fine dance that I'm trying to figure out how do I balance all these two things. I'm mean, speaking of your installations, which ones are you kind of most, um, most proud of or like, you know, what were the ones, some of the ones that are, that yeah. just stood out over time? I've only done three installations. I started last December. Mm. So I did an installation in December. We made the uh, world's tallest closet, which would fit um, a lifetime, one single person's lifetime of clothing in one structure. It's like over 3,000 items of clothing. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's 10 meters tall. Um, it was in a mall that we, in Cairo. And then in, in, in January, I created uh, an installation out of 168,000 straws that we collected off the streets of Vietnam. Uh, it took six months to collect the straws. We cleaned them, put them together into these two massive uh, parting waves. Uh, it was about, I forgot how tall it is. And it's two, two massive waves um, of, of, uh, representing the parting of the plastic sea. Um, and then in, in February, I created one in Singapore where we uh, took 18,000 plastic cups that we collected in a day and a half with the help of the National Environment of Singapore. So those are like the last three installations that I've played around with. Was there a message behind each one that you, or did you want to, the, uh, the, the viewer to kind of draw their own conclusions as to what, yeah, what so, they, those meant? Well, the world's largest closet was simply to remind people of the amount of stuff that we buy in the course of our lives mm -hmm. and that we don't need so much stuff that we only wear once or twice. Yeah, um, and, and, and and because our closets stay closed and because when we don't want something, we move it out to make space for more things, we don't actually see the amount of stuff we've accumulated, just like trash. And so that one's very much a commentary on fast fashion. With the straws, my, my goal was to show how little actions add up. So it might just be one straw, but then you multiply that over a certain number of people, over a certain number of days, and then it becomes huge. Yeah. And so while you may think that these individ individual actions don't matter, it really makes a difference. And in the case of, uh, of Singapore, you know, um, I mean, our tagline was like, <laughs> it's just it's just one cup at 18,000 people. Um, and these are cups that we collected. These are takeaway cups that we collected inside of food courts, right? Inside of the hawker centers. Mm. So these are takeaway cups that weren't even taken away. They were just used once because it, nobody wants to wash them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and these are the kind of conversations and thoughts that we try to provoke. Right. I mean, the, the one in our chat before as well, talking about the uh, some of the issues around sustainability and making it understandable. That's where potentially design can have a, um, a and some of those installations can can have a dramatic impact. Um, one of the the things that I kind of struggle with in, in thinking about sustainability is the um, how how it, you know a drop of water gets lost in a big ocean. I don't know what the actual incremental impact of all my actions are, but the power of visualization is, is tremendous and, and uh, being able to highlight that in some of your work is, is I, I think is one of the more interesting aspects. I think it's not about necessarily always quantifying the impact that you have onto the world. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's just about committing to something, you know, like, I don't know if you, if you're dating someone, uh, do you, are you constantly measuring the success of your relationship on a day to day basis and quantifying how and much iterating. you love one another and iterating right. upon it? Like it's just, <laughs> it's just not how the world works. You, 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 you kind of, you do the best that you can and you commit to something and, and, and you, you make that your life philosophy yeah. and then you nurture it together you work towards a common goal. Right. And then at the end, you either stay together or you don't, right? Yeah. But that's not how we tackle the rest of the world. Right. <laughs> that's interesting. So, I mean, I guess looking ahead, I mean, what's, you know, what, do you have an end goal in mind? You know, what would, what would success be um, for, for, your, for your career? You know, what the next decade kind of looks like? Um, I guess moving towards this, this, this potential startup, this, this way of building something bigger. So let me flip that question on his head. Do you yeah. know what the world's going to look like in 20 years? Do you know what the world's going to look like in 50? <laughs> yeah, no. what's, what's the point in planning yeah. that far ahead? I mean, in, in many ways, you look at the future of work, you look at uh, geo geopolitical instability, you look at um, the impacts of climate change. In so many ways, it's almost not worth thinking that far ahead. Mm -hmm. Because if you start thinking as a futurist, you're just going to get lost in your own expectations of what the future should be as opposed to what's actually happening around you. And so, so much of what I do, I think, is about, yes, th yes, yes, thinking long term, yes, building the, the foundation, the steps needed to get to the next level, but not, not having 
a, a, a peak as much as a direction to walk towards, mm -hmm. right? So the direction I'm walking towards is scaling impact in the world, connecting with people, um, hopefully unlocking their potential and getting them to realize that they can do something. It's not, they're not limited by what the world expects of them. Mm -hmm. They can create the change that they want to see, but the only way to start or the only way to get there is to start. Yeah. And if you're just, you know, head down, working on your job, doing your thing, you know, feeding your kids, doing everything that you're supposed to do, then you're never going to be out there doing what needs to be done. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I mean, the fact that you kind of took this really alternative path, I mean, do you ever look back and, and wonder, like, different, you know, life directions that, you know, if you stayed at your, you know, your mining job or, or your engineering job, um, what that would have been, been like? I mean, do you have, that sometimes I, you know, as, I mean, as if a there former is, lawyer, I yeah. thought about what have the last 10 years been like. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there was a, there would have been 0% chance of me staying in my job anyways. So mm -hmm. that's not the question. One mm -hmm. of the probable pivots was earlier in my life. I got accepted to two different universities. Mm -hmm. I got accepted to Waterloo in yep. biomechanical engineering, <laughs> yep. which would have taken me out of home and onto campus to kind of, I don't know, lead the real university campus life. Mm -hmm. And then this is the route that I actually ended up in, which was mining engineering. I was still staying at home. I didn't do the whole like frat house thingy. Mm -hmm. And I think those, that was probably the biggest split because I would have probably ended up with a very different network and subset of experiences that would have been very formative to where I would have ended up. Mm -hmm. So I think that would probably be the bigger question. Yeah. But I don't think that this sense of exploration, the sense of being a little bit rebellious and not and refusing to fit in and the sense of infinite possibility, I think those are like, character traits that I've always had as growing up. Like I used to read a ton of fantasy novels, a lot of science fiction, and it's always very clear what's right and what's wrong. It's always very clear that you're always fighting against the odds and there's so much at stake and there's a chance to be the hero or not, you know? Mm -hmm. And and so that I think creates a lot of the, um, the framework for my moral compass that I stick to. It's extremely idealistic, sometimes endearingly so, sometimes horribly misguided. Um, but, but I just keep at it because what I've learned over time is that if you truly believe in something and you are very public about it and you stick to it, you can find your tribe that will help elevate that and amplify that. And so much of what I do is a lot about paying it forward. Like I, I'm always trying to elevate others around me. I try to help everyone that I possibly can. When I'm less busy, I end up helping more people. I'm maybe not doing as much, but then that always comes back around. And, um, and I just have these kind of like, I think life philosophies that, that have really helped me uh, shape the support structure needed to do what I do. And mm -hmm. it's, it's been very interesting. In some sense, it doesn't matter what the future brings. It'll, it'll all work itself out. Cool. I mean, speaking of helping out, I, I definitely appreciate you taking the time and, and sharing your story. No, of course. Always happy uh, to and share. I, I guess you can tell folks, you know, the best way to, to stay in touch is that, is that Instagram or what, what's your, your favorite outlet these days? These days, it's Instagram. It's my favorite by default, not my it's like in spite of, <laughs> yeah. as opposed to because I truly love it. But um, at Von Wong, very absurd branding all over me. V-O-N-W-N-G. You can go to vonwong.com. You can find videos. You can find photos. You can find blog posts. I mean, I'm pretty prolific when it comes to these things. And you can find me on Facebook or whatever works. Awesome, man. Thanks for taking the time. Cool. Thank you for That's having great. me. All the best. Yep. Yeah. Ah! Yeah.